Not a moment too soon, your word I encase, my sins erase. Gave it up. That's when you me. Oh, I let it go. That's when you me. Oh, you brought me through, Lord. Now I'm in Oh, I let it go. You brought me through. I gave it up. Oh, I let it go. Oh, you brought me through. Now I'm brand new. Lord, have your way. Oh, I'm here to stay. You promised me you would hear my plea. And you did just what you said. Oh, I gave it up. Oh, I let it go. You brought me through. Oh, now I'm brand new. Lord, have your way. Oh, I'm here to stay. You heard my plea, now you promised me, and you did just what you said, and you did just what you said, and you did just what you said, and you did that's what you said. And you did just 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 what you said.
God does just what he says. If he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, you can't depend on that. He does just what he says. If he says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that rises against you in judgment he shall condemn, he does just what he says. It's good news to know that God does just what he says. I'm going to ask that you would stand with me if you're able as we prepare to read God's word. God's word today is the 27th Psalm comes to us in the 27th Psalm verses 4 through 7 in the New International Version. And it says this, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me at his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. Uh, verse 5, for in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Amen. You may be seated in God's house. Amen. And I like to tag this particular text and message for these brief moments of sharing that we have together today with the title, God is setting you up. God is setting you up. I remember as a little boy, my daddy introduced me uh, to scratch and dent merchandise. Uh, scratch and dent mer merchandise. The daddy Daddy said that since items have scratches and dents, most people don't want them, but, uh, but the owner of the scratch and dent store always takes the merchandise. The reason that he takes it, Daddy said, is because he understands that although the merchandise may have a few scratches or dents, it can still serve the purpose for which it was created. A stove with a dent in the side will still cook good food. A recliner with a scratch will still go back and recline. See, see, many of us in the church are scratched by trouble. We are dented by trial. We are scratched by temptation. We're dented by turmoil. Some of us are scratched by confusion, dented by dysfunction, scratched by being stabbed in the back and dented by being overlooked. Life has a way, if you're trying to live right, of scratching you and denting you up. I'm not talking about you being a down-looking believer, but I'm talking about when you're trying to live for God, you're trying to live right, you're trying to get somewhere, you're working to match potential with purpose. The psalmist teaches us that life has a way of scratching and denting you just a little bit. But, but I get excited when I think about how, like the store owner, God recognizes that although you've been scratched and dented, although you face trouble, although some folks might not want you around. Although some people think you've outlasted your usefulness, I'm glad that my God knows, like the store owner, that you can still serve your purpose. Uh, yes, there's an in the time of trouble, but when trouble shows up, when the scratches are too much to bear, when the dents are unbearable, the text said, God hides you. Several Christmases ago, we, we went to Disney World, and it was crowded beyond belief. This was before Aja was born. The streets of Magic Kingdom on Christmas Day, they were filled with people who traveled from all over the world to get a glimpse of Disney World. We were trying to get a front row seat to the Christmas Day parade that they show on television. Rhea was three years old, so this was seven years ago, and because she was small and couldn't see over all of the people, Rhea, at three years old, started to get 
frustrated. She, see, Rhea, my baby, the babe, middle baby, she wanted to see Mickey and Minnie and was getting frustrated. So guess what I did as her daddy? I put Rhea on my shoulders, and the boost onto my shoulders gave her the boost she needed to get to what she needed to see. Uh, see, sometimes stuff gets out of your reach. Uh, sometimes life seems out of reach. Sometimes your vision is blocked by your burdens and your joy is siphoned by sorrow. Sometimes trouble is overwhelming and whenever you get out of balance, whenever you want to go a little higher, whenever you want to get in God's presence, you got to ask God for a booster seat. Uh, oh, you ought to want to get in God's presence. You ought to have the same desire that David had. You ought to be searching for security. One thing that I have desired of the Lord that I will seek after is that I may dwell in your house. Why do I want to dwell in the house of the Lord? Because in God's house, there is abundant life. In God's house, there is peace beyond understanding. In God's house, there's joy unspeakable. In God's house, it works out for my good. My children stand a chance. There is deliverance in every now and then. I need a boost to get in God's house. Because if I can just get in God's house, then I know that everything in my life will work out for the good. And the good news is this, uh, that you don't have to wait until you get to church to get in God's house. You ain't got to wait till Sunday morning to get in God's house. His house is wherever you ask God to meet you. Uh, his house can be at your house. Uh, his house can be at the schoolhouse. His house can be at the jailhouse, the workhouse, uh, the car house. But you got to be able to tell God, boost my faith so I can always dwell in your house. There are some things, though, that you need to pack when you're trying to dwell in God's house. I need you, God, I need God to boost my love so I can dwell in your house. I need, I need God to pack some forgiveness for me so I can dwell in his house. I need him to pack patience and joy and self-control and peace and gentleness and goodness and meekness and faith because if I have those, then I always have the keys to God's house. In order to be set up by God, every now and then you need to boost David, the heart playing shepherd from the countryside. In the text, he's in deep trouble. The brother is in deep trouble. It sounds like David had cried so much and shed so many tears that he got tired of crying. You, you ever cried so much that your eyes get tired from crying? You, you ever cried? so much that, that, that your eyes are just weary, your face is weary, your tears, they, they don't even want to come out anymore, cried so much that your eyes were literally weary from shedding tears? Have you ever been waiting on God when it seems like God is never going to do anything about your situation? David is suggesting, he's saying, man, I could understand people who pretended to be my friends hating on me if I did something to them. I could understand if I had offended them, if I'd been mean to them, but in this case, they are backstabbing me without a cause. They're hating me just based on something they heard from somebody else because of something they told them about him. The truth is that sometimes the greatest pains are those that are inflicted by people that you have trusted and that you become vulnerable with in your life. See, those pains hurt. And have you wondering what's going on when people that you have been helping to hold up, people you thought were your ace, boom, boom, they've been there for you, you've been there for them, and they're not there for you in your time of need. It can feel like in the time of trouble, David is suggesting that what you dislike uh, about you, you don't even know if it's true what you dislike about me, and you don't care, you just hate me because you don't like yourself. The truth, the truth that David helped me understand in the text through the trajectory of the text is that great minds always talk about great ideas. Big minds always talk about big ideas. Spiritual minds always talk about spiritual ideas. And little minds spend all their time talking about people. David encapsulates all of his anguish and anxiety into one phrase when he says, In the time of trouble. Not if the time of trouble. Now, there, there, there is a guarantee that there will be trouble. 
And if I could Davisonize the text, it would say in the time when millions of people live in some form of poverty, health poverty, education poverty, information poverty, food poverty, financial poverty, in the time where there seems to be more poverty than plenty, where the top 1% of the wealthiest people in this nation control over 50% of the money, and we all are fighting, the rest of us are fighting for crumbs. In the time, in the time where there seems to be more darkness than light, more sadness than joy, more problems than solutions, in the time when journalistic integrity and human decency and decorum and ethics have given way to greed and salaciousness, in the time when there are people who are so blinded by their hatred and their racism that they cannot see each other as human beings, in the time when corporations refuse to pay their employees livable wages and retirement benefits, in the time of trouble. See, the thing we must understand about trouble is that it's not only individual in nature, it's not only seated in your personal life, but you must be sensitive to the fact that troubles is sometimes larger than you or me. In the time when the civil unrest, if there's civil unrest in our communities, in the time when folk peddle stereotypes and biases, I just mentioned the trouble to highlight just how awesome our God is. In the time when preachers are promoting statues instead of salvation. Help me, Jesus. In the time of trouble, the text, let me remind you, says that when all of this stuff is going on, when all of this is swirling around the world, when all of this is going on in the world, all of this makes us wonder if these are the last days. We are protected from the arrows and the darts because God starts covering us with his security blanket. I'm in the text. See, there are some folks in this house, you, you already got your own, you got your own diary of God's deliverances handy. You, you already got them for yourself. You should always keep with you a mental Rolodex of God's goodness and mercy. You should keep that with you at all times. Uh, and if you scroll the Rolodex in your mind, some of you who aren't too spiritually sophisticated, you can remember all the times that God has always covered you. Uh, your Rolodex ought to remind you that no matter where you are or how you feel, goodness and mercy have still been following you. Uh, your spiritual diary ought to remind you of just how good God has been to you. So David in writing the psalm, uh, he's already chronicled the goodness and mercy of God so he had some stuff that he could draw from. Uh, and if you don't remember, if the times are too shady for you, if what's going on in the White House is too much for you to bear, if it seems so long ago that God took care of you, let me remind you that I don't remember much, but this much I do when I was down, God picked me up. Uh, when when I was out, God brought me in. Uh, when I was low, God lifted me. Uh, when I was asleep, God watched over me all night long. Uh, when I was sick, God healed my body. When I was messed up, he fixed me. Uh, when I was working, he gave me strength. Uh, when my heart was sad, he gave me joy. When my faith was shaken, he gave me faith. Uh, see, sometimes the trouble shows up in the world so God can set you up. I hear you, You said, Pastor, that's not biblical. God... God doesn't set us up well. Well, I'm in the Bible, in, in the New Testament, the disciples asked Jesus one day if the man that was born blind, was he born because his mama uh, or daddy, was he born like that because his mama and daddy sinned? Jesus replied, neither. It was done so that God might be glorified. Uh, so every now and then, you got to think outside of yourself and look around and say, man, I'm dealing with this because God is really setting me up. Uh, so when your grip begins to slip, you ought to start talking to yourself and say, oh, it's just a setup. He just, he just doing something in my life that I have not been able to see yet. When despair is closing in, I'm being set up by God. When you wonder if God still cares about you, I'm being set up. When people try to manipulate you, when you're worried about tomorrow, every now and then, you ought to look up to heaven, to God, and say, God, set Set me up. Set me up. When I, I was in high school, I was, I was a shooter in high school in basketball. I was a shooter in basketball. I played, I played shooting guard, and there was a special play that they had for me because I could shoot. I can tell these stories in the past tense. Now, you know, in all your own stories, you, you are a hero. You, you can do it all in your own stories. Well, let tech, God call you and you get up here, you be telling these stories too. Let me, so, so I was, there was a play, there was a play that they had, there was a play we had, it was called Todd Rome. That's what, that was the play it was called. And, and whenever that was called, I had to do a whole lot of work just to try to get a shot. But the play was designed to get me a three-point shot. I had to run from one side of the court 
all the way to the other side of the court. I, I had to get through picks. There were two picks that would be set for me, guys standing in my way. I had to break through that. I had to cut through the painted area and back up, but it was all a setup so I could get the ball in position to shoot and make a three-pointer. You, you do know that as God is setting you up, you might have to go through some traffic. You might have some hellish situation to endure. You might wonder if this anguish is going to last forever. You might get tired of listening to the negativity, but you got to tell yourself you are being set up to make a difference, set up to make an impact because if you keep reading the text, it says that after he hides me, then it says he sets me up. I'm in the Bible. Somebody shout set up, set up, set up. It's a set up. It's a set up. The question though is what does God set you up to do? I'm glad you asked it. Two answers, I promise you. And y'all can go to dinner. First, first, you can take daddy. You can take daddy to dinner, even though you probably didn't make a reservation like you did for Mama's Day. You, you, you probably didn't do that. You, you probably didn't make a reservation like you did for Mother's Day a month in advance. You probably called this morning to take daddy. Daddy got to go to Burger King or McDonald's because Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays. Help me, Jesus. Two answers, two answers, and you can try to get your daddy or the father in your life, the father of your children, you can try to get them into a restaurant. Two answers, two answers. I promise you and I'll be done. First, first, the reason God sets you up, he sets you up to be raised set you up to be raised. Verse 6 of the text says, and now, meaning that what was being said before is being amended, something is being added to what was said in verse 5. See, since God has hidden me, since God has set me up, he says, then my head shall be lifted up. I, I like the way the message translation reads. It says, God holds my head and holds me head and shoulders above anybody who tries to put me down. Now, God set you up to be raised. Now, he wants to raise your understanding, to raise your ability to raise your faith to raise your confidence to raise your consistency he sets you up to be raised uh, to have a raised faith uh, an elevated consciousness and awareness of what God is doing in the atmosphere uh, how God is moving when God is talking where God is going then you got to yield your will and your way for God's will and God's way uh, see the world needs raised people who lift others by your love uh, those young folks who were in here today uh, they need a raised church uh, that knows how to love folk uh, no matter where they come from a raised people who lift others by your life a raised people who say my heart no longer desires to stay where doubts arise and fear dismays uh, my prayer my aim uh, is higher ground uh, higher ground uh, where the Holy Ghost has his way uh, higher ground uh, where wounded spirits can pray uh, higher ground uh, where you realize uh, that this ain't your church uh, or my church uh, but this is God's church uh, we need a raised church uh, who knows that God is still in control uh, and who want the freedom that the Holy Ghost gives. Uh, we need to raise people who know that God is still able to do exceeding abundantly uh, above anything you can ask or think. Uh, or raise people uh, who know that you are the salt of the earth, uh, who walk by faith uh, and not by sight, uh, who know that little becomes much uh, when placed in the hands of God. Uh, some folk who know that nothing, uh, and I mean nothing, uh, is too hard for God. Uh, raised, uh, you will raise your commitment. Uh, raised, uh, you'll think on good things raised that we can be transformed in parade magazine a few few years ago there was a story about a millionaire named Eugene Land Eugene Land he helped change the lives of of an entire sixth grade class in East Harlem Mr. Land had been asked to speak to the class of 59 sixth graders and he wondered this old man wondered what could he say to inspire these uh, the, these 11 and 12 year olds most of whom the statistics would suggest were going to drop out of school by the time they got to the 10th grade. He wondered how he could get these students to even pay attention to him. He scrapped his notes and decided to talk directly from his heart. He said, stay in school and I'll help pay the college tuition for all of you. He stay in school and at that moment the lives of those students changed. Their spirits were raised and they now had hope. One student said I had something to look forward to, something waiting for me. My head was raised up and guess what? He said it was a mighty good feeling. Uh, over 90% of that class uh, went on to graduate from high school and go to college uh, because they were raised. Uh, the situation might look bleak, uh, their outlook looked dismal, but they were raised. Uh, and after I read that story, uh, God just reminded me that if you can stay with 
him. If you can keep standing with tears so dies. If you can keep serving and keep doing what God told you to do, he will set you up and lift you up beyond your imagination. In a real sense, you've got something to look forward to. Why? Because eyes have not seen. Ears have not heard. Neither has it entered into your heart. What God has in store for those who love him. But you can't stop there in the text because while it says eyes haven't seen and ears haven't heard, it also says that God has revealed what he has in store through the spirit. You can see what God is doing and where God is leading only if you look through the spirit. If you only look with your eyes, then you might be disappointed. If you look with your eyes, it looks mighty bad and bleak. If you look with your eyes, it doesn't look like much. Through your eyes, you get upset about change. But if you take a moment and just look through the spirit, stop focusing on what you see and start reading what God says and looking by faith. Look by faith and you'll see God moving. Look by faith and you'll see God working. Look forward because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. If you stay and keep serving, stay and keep praying, stay and keep pushing, stay and keep loving, stay and keep forgiving, God will raise you up. Two people walking with their heads down. Two people walking with their heads down get lost. They get lost or they drift. They drift apart because they don't really see where they're going. But somebody who's looking up, who, who's looking forward, somebody has to help them get to where they're going. And God is calling us, church, to lift up our heads. I, I hear my granddaddy pushing me through the corridors at times. Granddaddy would say it like this, like David, lift up your heads, O ye gates. Yeah. Our granddaddy would wake me up with that on Sunday morning. If I spent the night at his house on Saturday, he'd pull my big toe and he'd say, lift up your head, O ye gates. And be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the yeah. King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. He is the King. Granddaddy, what did you say? What did you say? He lift up your head, O ye gates. Even lift him up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Yeah. Lift up your head. And I promise you, God will come in. Uh, that's an indicative promise. So if you want God in, then you got to lift up your head. Uh, uh, what a mighty God we serve who sets you up just so you can get closer to him. Uh, if you want the headland healed, uh, you got to raise your head. Uh, if you want God to come in, uh, you got to be raised. Uh, if the world is going to change, uh, you got to be raised. Uh, so if it's hard out there where you are, it's a rough place where you are, here's my recommendation. Uh, won't you come on up a little higher? Uh, no no more raggedy living, uh, no more faithless journey, uh, no more fast and funny money. Uh, come on up a little higher, uh, no more scheming and uh, conniving, uh, no more vulgar language uh, and vulgar examples, uh, no more gossip and slander, uh, no more looking down, uh, no more looking down and turning your nose up at other people, uh, no more fear, uh, no more hopelessness. Uh, come on up a little higher uh, and change your testimony to I'm pressing on uh, the upward way, uh, new heights I'm gaining uh, every day. Uh, now, though some may dwell uh, where these are bound, uh, my prayer, my aim uh, is higher ground. Lord, lift me up uh, and let me stand. Oh, y'all gonna make me work hard on Father's Day. God sets you up to be raised. But not only, not only does it set you up to be raised, but this, this part, this part messed with me. Mess with me. I know it's going to mess with some of you. He also set you up finally to be radical. Yeah. To be radical. I'm in the text. The text continues. Now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. The message translation puts it like this. He says, I'm headed for, for his place to offer anthems that will raise the roof. Already, I'm going in, I'm singing God's songs, I'm making music to God. Imagine if all of us, on our way to the temple, if all of us had a song we were singing. It, it doesn't matter if your song is great as thy faithfulness, and my song is I need you to survive. 
It doesn't matter if your song is how great thou art and, and mine is how great is our God. But, but, but if you came from the east of the building and, and I came from the west of the building and then somebody came from the south and some of you came up from the basement and you had a song and you came already with a song. You can't see it. I, I can see it. If we all could just, you, you, you came with a, with a song. If maybe yours is Blessed Assurance, number 27 in the Baptist hymnal. Maybe, maybe yours is number one in the Baptist hymnal. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. I, I don't know what your song is, but if all of us came with a song, can, can you imagine the kind of worship? But we don't all come with a song. Some of us come just to talk about other people. Some of us come so we can sit and refuse to participate in church. Some of us come with the intention of being, being a part of the I shall not be moved ministry. Then, then some come to hear a word from God. Some show up because they're seeking God's face. Yes, yes. But, but what if all of us showed up marching from our cars? You got out the car with a song. You, you ain't got to be, because everybody can't sing, you ain't got to be singing it from your lips if you just carried it with you from the car in your heart. It's just just... I want you to try that one Sunday. I, I, and, and I know if you did it, because I, I feel it when I walk, when I come in the building and I come out the office, I'm on my way. I, I, you can feel the power of the Holy Ghost if we all came with a, with a song. The text says, I'm, I'm headed for God's place to offer anthems that will raise the roof. As a matter of fact, already before I get there, I'm singing God's songs and I'm making music to God. Yeah. See, the psalmist I, I like this because the psalmist didn't declare that his condition had changed. He doesn't tell us that, that, that trouble has left his building, but he says that because I know God is covering me, that even though the trouble is still in the atmosphere, even though the stronghold is still in the camp, even though there's still some trouble in the environment, I'm going to make music that's going to raise the roof. And guess what? If I raise the roof, the devil, hell, and the stronghold got to get out of here. Help me, Jesus. That, see, this ain't about what you want to do. The, the scripture says it's a sacrifice. Yes. The psalmist says sacrifices of joy. This violates everything about who I am or what I think I am, but I'm going to offer a sacrifice. You, you know what? I like to look like lemons are always my lunch, but I'm going to smile. I'm going to offer a sacrifice. I, there is no salvation. There is no soul saving. There is no transition from goodness to godliness that doesn't require sacrifice. I, I will be radical enough to praise God so much that it raises the roof. I, and when I raise the roof, it might cause somebody else to still have sacrifice some hope in the world. Uh, God set you up to be radical. Uh, it takes a radical person to sing and to move uh, even though your condition is still in the same condition. Uh, it takes radical to praise God even though times are tough for you. It's radical to celebrate the Lord when you really could be having pity on yourself. Uh, God set you up to be radical. It's radical to thank God in advance. Uh, it's radical to rejoice in trouble. Uh, imagine uh, what the devil wouldn't know what to do with you if you ever saw your money dwindling in your account and you looked up to glory and you said thank you Lord the devil wouldn't know what to do with you if you went to check your bank account and it wasn't enough there and you said God I thank you for what's in there now and I thank you in advance for what you're going to put in there for me going forward I know you're going to make a way out of nowhere. I, I dare you today. I dare you. I dare you today to think about what the Lord has done for you. I, I dare you. I dare you to look back over your life. Look back over your life and you think of God's goodness to you every day of your life. It, it's, it's radical to remember it, it, and not be too mean or uh, to celebrate the goodness of God. See, God's goodness is not reserved simply for a shout or a dance, uh, but his goodness should be all over your face. 
If God been good to you, you ought to look like God has been good to you. You ought to think of how the Lord made a way for you. Got somebody through college, uh, got you through graduate school, uh, through law school, medical school, dental school. He got somebody. Some of y'all graduated summa cum laude. Some of you graduated magna cum laude. Some of you graduated cum laude. And some of us graduated, thank you, laude. He got rent paid when you were down to nothing. Meditation and contemplation about God ought to call you to be radical. Uh, it's radical to love your neighbor as yourself. It's radical to bless them that curse you, to pray for them that use you. It's radical God is calling us to be. Any radical folks in the house today? You gotta be radical. If you're radical, then your salvation like the rude boys, they had a song that said it's written all over your face. You ain't got to say a word. And you smile, you smile, you smile, you smile for me. It's more than any word I ever heard. It should be written all over your face that you love the Lord. It, you know, I would not have to ask you, do you know Jesus? I not have to tell, I ought not have to ask you, have you been reading your Bible? You, have you been studying the scriptures? I ought to be able to see it. Is it on your face? Are you smiling? Are you, do you have joy? Do you love the Lord with your face? Yeah. I get it. You say, Pastor, I, I don't do a whole lot of shouting and running and dancing. You can do a lot of smiling. You, you can do a lot of smiling. And guess what? Smiling also starts with your eyes. You, you can make a whole lot of impact with just your smile. You see, your face ought to testify that the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Your face will say, if he doesn't deliver me, I know it ain't because he's not able. Uh, your face will say that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Isn't it good to know that your own strength, it doesn't have to be enough. Uh, that your own joy doesn't have to be enough. But that the joy of the Lord uh, will be your strength. Yeah. It's a radical text because the trouble has not changed. The trouble hadn't changed for David, but David's countenance has changed. He has a radical transformation, even though his location is still the same. Don't you know God doesn't have to change your location to change your situation or, or your elevation, your destination, and God can use your current situation as transportation to his destination. That he wants to help me, Holy Ghost. Stop, stop letting folks tell you who you are or what you can do with their poisonous proclamations. Uh, God has given you a new name and a new claim and a new integrity. Stop letting folks build oppressive walls of denial around the tender stems of your ambitions or your anointing. Uh, you are not helping. Hopeless. Uh, you are not hopeless. Uh, you are not defeated. You are not deficient. You are not deleted. You are not destroyed. You are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. That's radical. As long as I'm a child of God. Uh, as long as I can feel the Holy Ghost. As long as I'm saved by grace. As long as I know that Jesus has brought me from where I was to where I am right now. You can be radical. You got a mind to think with, a heart to feel with, hands to work with, and a soul to pray with. You got enough. You got enough to be radical for Jesus. Uh, I'm done. I'm done after this. On, on February 15, 1921, in Cain Summit Hospital, a doctor was performing an appendectomy. Dr. Evan O'Neill Cain is the one performing the surgery. Dr. Cain, in his distinguished 37 year medical career, he has performed nearly 4,000 appendectomies. So this surgery will be une uneventful, except for two things. The first new application in this surgery is the use of local anesthesia for major surgery. Up until this point, they had to anesthetize you fully to perform surgery, or they didn't anesthetize you at all. So, so the first, the first app new application was that they were going to do local anesthesia. Dr. Kane was an avid believer that local anesthesia was much better and safer than general anesthesia. Many of his colleagues agree with him in principle, but before they go all the way in, all in with them, they need to see the theory in application. Dr. Kane then searches for a volunteer, a patient, stay with me, who is willing to undergo surgery while under local anesthesia. A volunteer cannot be found. Uh, eventually, though, Dr. Kane 
finds a candidate. So on Tuesday, February 15th, this historic operation occurs. Uh, the patient is prepped uh, and wheeled into the operating room. Uh, a local anesthetic is applied uh, as he's done thousands of times. Uh, Dr. Kane dissects the superficial tissues uh, and locates the appendix. Uh, he skillfully excises the appendix uh, and concludes his surgery. Uh, during the procedure, the patient complains of only some minor uh, discomfort in his body. Uh, the volunteer is taken into the post-op uh, and then placed in a hospital bed. Uh, he recovers quickly uh, and is released from the hospital just two days later. Uh, Dr. Kane had proven his theory. Uh, thanks to the willingness of a brave volunteer, uh, Dr. Kane demonstrated uh, that local anesthesia was a viable uh, and even preferable alternative uh, to full anesthesia. Uh, but I said that there were two facts uh, that made the surgery unique. Uh, the first was the use of local anesthesia. Uh, the second was who the patient was. Uh, the courageous candidate uh, for this surgery uh, was Dr. Kane himself. Uh, to prove his point, uh, he did something radical. Uh, he operated on his own appendix. Uh, the doctor became a patient uh, in order to convince the patients uh, that they could trust the doctor. Uh, the doctor became a patient uh, so others would know uh, that trusting him uh, was all right. Uh, he felt the infer infirmities uh, of the afflicted uh, to help somebody else get healed. Uh, he didn't need surgery himself. Uh, his appendix was still healthy. Uh, his body was all right, uh, but he decided to perform surgery uh, on himself uh, so that we would trust uh, that surgery is all right. Uh, is there anybody here uh, that knows where I'm going? Uh, and I just thought about God uh, and how radical God is. Uh, he made him uh, who knew no sin uh, to be sin for us, uh, that we might be made uh, the righteousness of God in him. Uh, that sacrifice, uh, the word became flesh uh, and dwelled among us. Uh, that's why he's called Emmanuel, uh, which being interpreted is uh, God with us. Uh, there is one uh, who knows how to be a friend. Uh, there is one uh, who sticks closer than a brother. Uh, there is one uh, who can raise up friends for you. Uh, there is one uh, who will hold your hand uh, when you walk through the valley uh, of the shadow of death. Uh, and I don't know about you, uh, but I have decided uh, to put my hope in that man. Uh, Jesus got like you uh, to convince you uh, that you could trust him uh, with your life. Uh, so I have declared uh, that my hope is built uh, on nothing less uh, than Jesus' blood uh, and righteousness. Uh, I dare not trust uh, the sweetest frame, uh, but wholly lean uh, on Jesus' name. Uh, on Christ, uh, the solid rock I stand. Uh, on Christ, uh, the solid rock I stand. Uh, is there anybody here uh, that's standing on Christ? Uh, on Christ, uh, he died on Friday, uh, but they performed surgery. Uh, in that operating room uh, called the tomb. Uh, all night Friday, uh, God was doing surgery. Uh, all day Saturday, uh, God was doing surgery. Uh, all night Saturday, uh, God was doing surgery. Uh, and my Bible says uh, that early, uh, and I mean early, uh, on Sunday morning, uh, that Jesus got up uh, with all power in his hands. Uh, is there anybody uh, that loves my Jesus? Uh, is there anybody here uh, that loves my Lord? Uh, say yes, uh, say yes, uh, say yes. I love the Lord. He heard my cry and pitied every groan. Long as I live and trouble rise, I'll hasten, I'll hasten to his throne. God is setting you up, set you up to be raised, set you up to be radical. And now I gotta offer the sacrifice of joy. Smile. Let your salvation be all over your face. And that, that's what the world needs. Church, we got to get love right in here. Because we're battling hell and the devil outside of here. People are looking for, for love. I read, stand with me, I read a study that says millennials. Millennials are much more loving and open to anybody than those who are not millennials. 
And so they're turning away from organized religion because in organized religion they see separation and they see borders and boundaries and they see can't do and don't do and we don't welcome that here. And, and, and the, the, the seven last words of a dying church, we've never done it that way before. They, they say they see that in the church. And now they see from, from, from those who claim to be a part of the church this promotion of slavery and separation and segregation and ripping children from mamas and children from families instead of granting asylum. They see that from the church. But what I saw yesterday here at that home going service that we, we had here was I saw, I saw teenagers, 400 teenagers in here who were hungering and thirsting for, for the word of God, for the love of God, for somebody to show them a better way, a different way. The path to love has got to start here. Stop playing. We can't keep playing with each other. We can't keep pretending to be faithful and to be believers in God. When you choose not to be loving, you are doing a disservice. You are detrimental to the advancement of God's kingdom. Whether you think you're doing it in private or you do it in public, we got to get this love thing right in the church. There's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing that should cause you to be mean in church. To be mean to somebody at church. I don't care what it is. There is no excuse. Amen. That's just the way I am will get better. That's just the way I like it, do better. Love has to be our language if we're going to help transform the world. Because if we don't love in here, we are no better. We are no different That's right. than the world. That's right. No different. Got to get it right. Or go home. Song said, get right church and let's go home. If you don't get it right, then we might as well close our doors and not continue to do this. But if, if we can get love correct, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, and how do we lift them? We lift them through our love for each other. He said, I will draw all, all people unto me. Father God, we pray today. We pray today, God, that we would raise our conversations, that we would raise our consciousness about what you're doing and where you're moving and what you're speaking to your people. We pray, God, that we would be committed to being radical, that we would radically love each other, God, in ways that we've never before seen in your house, that we would challenge ourselves to be better, to serve better, to love more, to strengthen, to pray for, to eliminate the negative conversations from our communication, to instead of talking about each other, praying with each other.